Well, hello, folks, and welcome to episode 170 of Retro Power Uncut. And unusually, we start in the body prep area. So we're going to start with the Churchill two-door coupe Mark II Jaguar project, which, as I speculated last week, is undergoing more sanding. Uh, Mark's got the next coat of polyester that I think we mentioned last week, uh, a light overall coat of, uh, of polyester spray surfacer, which is basically like a sprayable filler. We use that instead of a high build primer. It's much more stable, less prone to sinkage. So that's had another coat of that over the whole lot to try and pick up any areas where we've, we've got quite a few areas where we were through to, where we were all the way through any build that we had. Uh, and the shape was pretty much there or thereabouts. So another coat of that enables everything to be blocked without any high and low spots from where we're, so from where we're getting thin, thin areas of coating. Minimizes those, the high and lows that inevitably occur where you, where you break through the build, where you break through the polyester. So now there should be very, hopefully very few areas where we actually go all the way through the polyester. So I think we're on the later stages. I'm not going to uh, count my chickens too much, but we're on the later stages of the, uh, of the sort of high build stages of this. The next phase really will be epoxy, but uh, I think we're a little way away from that yet. There's a bit of work to do around all the wheel arches, swage lines, detail work in the shuts, etc. Et but the main blocking somewhere near yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah just a lot of nitpicking there's a lot of areas that are quite tricky on this there's a lot of areas that have been a bit of a fight all the way through the rear wheel arches have been quite challenging the door shuts have been quite challenging there's been quite a few areas where it's 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 been it's tested us a little bit this one so uh, we, we kind of anticipated that would be the case but it's it's been a bit of a challenge but yeah on marching on Mark's blocking away and uh, I imagine we're going to be pretty dusty and still sanding next week in here but but getting towards the latter stages of that so that's where we're at the Churchill in the background behind that is the Redux E30 M3 which uh, Gary's just doing the prep work for the bond lines for the carbon panels so he has uh, finished all of the coatings that need to be done and there are various coatings but he's finished the coatings that need to be done before the panel work is bonded into place so we have the Upol Raptor coatings on where we need them on the the stone chip coating basically it's a, a two-pack polyurethane truck bed liner coating that we use bear in mind the cars are zinc metal sprayed underneath as well that's on in all the sort of stone chip facing areas and inside the quarter panels and then the inside is all done in a, a satin black finish uh, which is a, a polyurethane finish as well and in the uh, inside the boot area so all of the all of the areas that aren't accessible for paint uh, uh, later on are all now done uh, the scaffolding so to speak is 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 in the car still uh, holding everything located correctly cars on its uh, on its little jig trolley that holds everything uh, in the correct places so the scaffolding is still in making sure everything's located correctly so we're just getting all the panels lined up now working making it making sure that we've got through to clean steel on all of the uh, bond lines so that everything's ready so that the uh, carbon panels can be bonded on so yeah that's the where we're at on that one brief uh, brief touch on that and then we'll wander out here to uh, rest of the workshop and we've got progress on several fronts here We've got the Allegro project. Sam's just been working on the radiator expansion tanks. We're using the Japanese style expansion tanks on these, uh, what I'd refer to as a Japanese style, where it's uh, the radiator is completely filled with, as per what the, what the Hondas used originally, basically. So you completely fill the radiator with coolant. There's no internal expansion space within the cooling system probably going to be teaching people to suck eggs here and I may have said about it on a previous episode can't remember now but the, the you have to remember water has a coefficient of expansion the reason cars have uh, a header tank or an expansion tank on top of the radiator is because water expands when it gets hot no surprises there if you fill the cooling system completely with water it will expand and have to get out somewhere so what you can either do is leave some airspace within the cooling system for that coolant to expand into, or do what the Japanese tend to do, which is fill the cooling system completely full of water, and then have a radiator cap that uh, allows the, as the water expands, it expands out through the uh, pressure relief cap, down a pipe that leads into the bottom of a, uh, an external reservoir that isn't pressurized, 
so as the coolant expands, it goes down that pipe and fills up that secondary reservoir. And then as the cooling system cools back down and the, uh, the, the water contracts again, it then draws that coolant back through the pressure cap uh, as, as, it, as it cools down, it sucks that coolant back up. That's the system we're using on these for no great reason other than that's how Honda did it. And it, it does actually help us out in that if you have an integral header tank in the system, it has to be high, It has to be the highest point of the system. So the air naturally uh, makes its way to that point. And if we do that, it just creates some other problems for us in the engine bay. So we're going with the Honda system and the original Honda tank doesn't really fit anywhere sensible and we can't get it new. So uh, Sam's fabricated some aluminium tanks to do that job and he's just bracket, sorting the bracketry out for that car. He couldn't do that before because it had the rotisserie mounts on it. So he's just removed them while he does the uh, bracketry for that and then the rotisserie mounts will go back on. And to that end, that car this afternoon will be coming off the jig, going onto the rotisserie so we can start the underside work on that one. Bobby has also been working on the, the doors for uh, car number two, the brown car. Uh, he might, yes, because we haven't got the doors for this car here at the moment. They're at KS Composites at the moment. He's been working on the doors for the brown car, the second car, um, fitting the central locking actuators into the doors on that, making the provisions for those. And he's also just finished off doing the provision for the uh, wiring conduits that go from the A pillars into the actual doors themselves, so we've got somewhere to run the wiring through. He's also been doing the, um, continuing what we uh, mentioned, touched on last week, continued with the mountings in the footwells for the twin PDUs and the ECU. I think the ECU was actually done last week, but he's finished the mountings for the two PDUs. We're using ECU, we're using two ECU master 16 channel PDUs and one ECU master engine ECU. Uh, the twin PDUs are both CAN bus uh, linked, so they're, they're controlled through the CAN network on the car both have a main uh, power feed to them and then on all, all their outputs and then just a can feed to tell them what to do. Uh, so he's got those mounted in the footwell and then built the kick plate, cover plate, which will cover them up, keep them nice and tucked out of, the, out of harm's way and also form like the uh, footrest underneath the carpet. That's all been done, that's in, uh, in aluminium. That's a pretty strong sort of uh, nice footrest area in the, uh, in the passenger footwell. So that's all done. So I think that's pretty much uh, where we're at on that. And then, as I say, this one's going to be coming off the... Ah, he's just been doing a last thing. He's just had one of the um, actual final fitment wheels on the car just to check for clearance on the uh, washer, on the um, screen wash tank, because it's quite tight on the wheel on lock. Uh, but we've, uh, it's actually plenty. It's got... There's over 30... I think about 35 millimetres of clearance, so plenty enough clearance uh, for what we need there. So, uh, yeah, that's all looking really good really happy that's coming off the jig we can get all the underside work done there's quite a lot of grotty metal work underneath on that from where the uh, floor pan modifications were made obviously underneath nothing's been dressed because it's on the jig it's not accessible the welds were done from the top so the the central chassis rails where they were modified they've been welded from the inside of the car but they need to be finished on the underside of the car uh, and that that can't be done yet once that's off onto the rotisserie we can do all that underside finishing so that's all uh, that will be nice to get get buttoned up and that'll be pretty much the that body shell will be then pretty much as complete as it can be until we get the carbon panels to that end things are progressing well at ks the books are finished and i believe probably this week next week the molds are being made so we're looking somewhere near end of the month i believe end of this month early next uh, month for final carbon parts for the quarter panels and wings at which point we can actually then finish the complete fabrication on both of these cars at that point we can actually finish the metal work so really exciting point to be at so we want to get that done the other uh, detail point actually i'll mention in the background not no work at the moment the other thing we're waiting for is the carbon one of the carbon air boxes i've ordered that from uh, reverie components uh, there's an ITG filter inside a carbon air box that's going on uh, over the throttle bodies and we need that to sort out the positioning of the electric power steering, electro-hydraulic power steering pump um, because that's going to sit just around underneath the end of the air box above the steering rack so we've got to finalise that, I've mentioned it before, I'll mention it again we've got to finalise the positioning of that, we can't do that until we've got the air box that should be here today or tomorrow actually I believe, all being well so yeah, that's where we're at with that lot uh, all, all good progress really um, Another thing I'll mention, actually, while we're, while we're stood here, is I had a visit yesterday from uh, a chap by the name of Stuart, Stuart Bearcroft, from uh, Goodflex Rubber Company. 
who have helped us out recently. I say helped us out, we bought some things from them, but they've been very, very helpful on the escort projects next door. Not, not really a metalwork issue, not, 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 not something that's relevant to what we're doing here at the moment, but it was just, it's just in my mind, so I'll mention it. Uh, an, an area that we have had many problems with is the permeation of fuel vapour through fuel hoses, particularly fuel filler hoses, causing a smell inside vehicles and generally fuel hoses not being of a sufficient standard to withstand modern fuels with ethanol, high ethanol content. And finally, after searching around and around and going to all sorts of sources that I thought should know how to solve that problem, we finally found a company that could solve that problem and that was Good Flex Rubber, who supplied us with um, FKM line uh, fuel hose and it's made incredibly well and it has absolutely no fuel vapour permeation with modern fuels and we're really happy with that and it was a custom made custom made hose at a very reasonable price made to order in a very quick time so good flex rubber very very good supplier very very helpful now Stuart coming over uh, was beneficial to both of us he wanted to have a little look around here which was really nice it was really good to see him nice to have a chat but actually it had a, a secondary benefit to us and hopefully them as well, which is while he was here, he mentioned, um, I asked him about custom made, one, two, maybe three off, uh, coolant hose sets. Now I'm aware of how they're made, we've dealt with this before, and I was talking to him about how, how we could go about making mandrels for them, uh, stainless steel tube mandrels I've done before, talking to him about the nuances of making mandrels for custom hose sets. And at that point, he mentioned why not 3D print them. And it turns out that Goodflex have the capacity to 3D print mandrels that will withstand multiple trips through their hose autoclave or hose oven, depending on how they're curing those hoses. And that's really good news because it means that potentially going forward, we can make one and two off flexible coolant hose sets for our vehicle builds. Now, I'm looking at an Allegro here, it won't actually really help us on this because we're actually going to be able to use a standard off-the-shelf Honda hose set on this because all the hoses, bar two slight shortenings, are just Honda hoses here. So that's a bad example, but going forward that could be a really useful process for us. And I thought I'd mention it because a lot of people wouldn't be aware of the possibilities there. That Because uh, I certainly wasn't aware that there was a 3D printable material or readily 3d printable material that was even reasonably affordable that would withstand um you know 300 degrees ish in an autoclave or i don't think the cure temperature is quite that high but between two and 300 degrees c in an autoclave so that's really good news really helpful for us and hopefully that's something we'll be able to do on some of our builds going forward because it really will make for a really neat solution um, at the moment we tend to try and use straight sections of hose and, and quite a lot of aluminium fabrication to, to work out one and two off sort of coolant systems. But if we can use 3D printed mandrels and make probably uh, you know eight, one hose set plus a couple of spares for a project car, then that's, that's a really neat solution. It gives the customer spare parts for the future. We've got the parts to fit to the car and it all looks like an OEM original manufacturer part. Really good. So yeah, that was a, a very beneficial visit for both of us, I think. Moving on from there, we're going to go over to have a little look at the interceptor uh, and there's a bit of work going on this on several fronts we have the bonnet we'll start at the bonnet um, in uh, just in the foreground here is matt uh, who is doing a trial with us uh, at the moment and um, he's doing a bit of a trial with us this week uh, and he has set two on the bonnet and we had a little look at the bonnet on monday and the conclusion was that it needs reskinning. Despite being brand new, it needs reskinning. There is a similar problem to the problem we have with the doors in that the way the outer skin has been fixed to the inner skin at production has caused us defects in the panel that we can't remove due to the frame blocking access. So Matt's de-skinned the bonnet uh, and got that all ready to reskin. So we're just waiting for a new skin for that now so that we can reskin that. Same, same process happening with the doors. We mentioned that last week. Tom's cracked on with this uh, near side door. Been a few ups and downs on that, a few difficulties. The door skins were a little bit short for the aperture, so we've had to do quite a bit of rework in making the, in lengthening the skin slightly to get them to fit, to better fit the aperture. And there's been a few traumas with certain other areas on those skins not being a perfect fit. But we're getting close now, I think, to having it somewhere near fitting the aperture. In the meantime, 
Matt's been working on the front end, getting various deficiencies out of the panel work, shall we say. There's a few dents uh, in the panels that needed taking out. And then there's some weld finishing around the front valance where the uh, valance is welded to the wings or welded to the front panel. I'm not sure if it's the wing or the front panel, but where there's weld lines on that front panel, uh, there was quite a bit of waviness. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fair bit of waviness in the panel there and that needed taking out. And then also the swage line, this swage line, runs around here sorry Matt poking in your eyes <laughs> that's the swage line that runs around the front there again where the joins were made that was quite wavy and there was a, a bit of waviness in that step so Matt's done a very nice job of chasing that as much as he possibly can to try and straighten that swage line out uh, he's got that pretty close but there's not really enough material to play with to get it perfect so he's finalized that with some lead just to get that nicely tidied up and there was also a bit of a sort of a dog leg kick in the uh, in the wheel arch both sides where the joint where the wing was joined to the balance so he's got that out he's pulled that out and hammer and dollied that out as much as possible and then he's tidying up the outside face uh, with lead foiling and a little bit of panel beating just to get all that right and then he's going to cut the lead in around the wheel arch and tidy, tidy that lot up and so then it's really we've got to wait for the bonnet skin before we can finish the before we can really do the lead work around the bonnet aperture that's where we're at on the front end in parallel with that, Stu's been working on the tailgate. I'll, uh, I'll stand over here to keep making Jamie's life a bit easier. But Stu's been working on the tailgate at the back. Um, originally, the tailgate was lifted by a set of springs that I've, uh, I've got a bit of a farming background, and the springs remind me of the old lift springs on a Massey Ferguson 30 seed drill, I think. <laughs> but, uh, they, they look like they ought to be on a piece of farm machinery, not on the tailgate of a car. So we've decided to not use those and put gas springs on it. Of course, a slight complication on that is not knowing what pressure of gas spring we need. So Stu's done a bit of engineering on the back, and basically rigged up, jury rigged a bit of a, a setup on the back to enable us to put, do a pull test. We've actually pull tested it to our steel rack because that's bolted down. So we did have a pull test um, with a crane scale on there just to measure the, uh, the force required to open that tailgate throughout its arc and work, work out where the force was highest and what force was required. So we've done that. And at that point, Stu's been able to spec some um, gas uh, struts and uh, some nitrogen springs that will lift that tailgate correctly, hopefully. We've got a first one, you know, there can be some fine tuning if needs be, but we've got an initial uh, spec for the, um, for the gas springs that are needed to open the boot. And he's now making the mounts for the gas springs that go under the tailgate, which is surprisingly flimsy with no glass in it. The glass is more structurally important on that than the steelwork, to be honest. Um, but he's making some framework to take the gas springs on the frame, on the uh, tailgate frame, and then some um, mountings that go into the uh, onto the top of the rear wheel arches inside the boot uh, for the opposite end of those springs. So, so that we've we've got that problem solved. Uh, and then he's also done the finished the battery tray. He's made the battery tray and the battery tray mounts in the back for a pretty big battery. We go. We tend to go on most of our daily driver stroke regular use type vehicles rather than motorsport track day leaning type vehicles we tend to go for a big lead acid old-fashioned battery they're just big old dependable yes they're heavy yes there are downsides but they just do the job and work and they start your car when you need it to there's no fancy lightweight stuff going on we tend to stick with the good old-fashioned technology it's more reliable on a car that you just want to work every day for track days obviously we would then put we put a bit more thought into lightweight batteries much more modern stuff but they are harder work they need more attention they're not as um, foolproof as a good old-fashioned lead acid battery so that's what we stick to so we've got a big i can't actually remember which model it is but a big lead acid battery in the back of this because it's going to have there's quite a lot of battery demand on a vehicle like this so we've just made sure that we're not we're not cutting uh, cutting ourselves short in terms of battery capacity so that's what stu's been on with and he's pretty much getting there i think now i think the tailgate stuff's about there the battery mountings are about there so yeah progressing progressing well on several fronts simultaneously on this which is what we're aiming to do and then yeah we've got some more projects uh, coming in which will be we were kind of hoping one of them would be here but there's a bit of a space still at the moment as you can see so it's not turned up uh, there's been a bit of a transport issue on getting one of them here so i'm not going to say anything about it because it's not here yet so we'll we'll break that news when it arrives and there's another project in the background uh, which will also be uh, interesting when it rolls up um, 
it, it actually ties into something lying around in this workshop that uh, has probably been out of shot in most of this video, but it ties in quite nicely to something we've got lying around the workshop. I'll drop that hint and see if anybody can guess what it is. But, uh, but yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's another very exciting project waiting in the wings to uh, announce. Again, we'll hold fire until it actually is here. But, uh, but yeah, we, we re I'm re really disproportionately excited about the, uh, the, these upcoming things. So that's really good news. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I was going to cover. We're also going to have a bit of a reveal. And I think I mentioned a while back about a, uh, a new bit of machinery in the workshop. We're not going to cover it today because we're perilously close to actually having it sort of installed and looking a bit more reasonable. It's been in a bit of a state for the last few weeks just because of move, trying to move lots of things around and tidy the place up and do some construction work and various other things. But I think by next week, we should have it in a more photogenic state. So I think we'll perhaps do a reveal on a new bit of machinery next week as well. So at that point, I think it's time to hand over to Cal in the assembly shop. So I shall see you all next week. Uh, thank you, Nat. Uh, I'm probably going to start by mentioning the fact that there is an absentee in the workshop uh, in the form of the Land Cruiser. Um, so this weekend just gone, I took it down, I would say bright and early, but it was very dark and early, uh, to Bista Heritage for the first Sunday scramble of the year. Uh, we had it parked up on the uh, Heritage Skills Academy uh, stand down there. Uh, so, if anybody saw it, I hope you uh, enjoyed looking at it. I didn't spend much time with it, I have to say. Initially, when I turned up, it was absolutely freezing cold, and I spent most of my time walking around, trying to keep warm, clutching a warm drink. Um, and then my family turned up, so I was trying to keep my kids from going insane by walking around and looking at various other cars. Um, but the culmination of uh, taking it down there was actually handing it over to the owner. So uh, I drove it down there, he joined me later on in the day and then drove it home and, and actually has been using it as his daily car ever since. Um, and so far, so good, feedback's been positive, so um, hopefully that will continue and uh, you might see it on the streets of London if you live down that way. Uh, moving on from that, Camaro. Um, so actually one thing I've been doing this week is having a massive clear up on the shelves. We've got to that stage. We often get to the, these two are probably at the same stage, the two escorts, where we have an enormous amount of parts on the shelves upstairs and you suddenly realise that there's not much left to go on the car and you start going through the shelves thinking, well, yeah, all of this stuff is old stuff that we're not using or, you know, temporary parts or whatever. And so I decided the time was ripe to have a massive clear out on the shelves upstairs, consolidate everything down and suddenly it seems a bit more manageable. Every time you go up there to get a pass, there's, there's only a handful of things up there. Um, and that kind of triggered a few remaining jobs that are on the cards for this. Um, so we're, we're, we're chipping into some of them and carrying on with some of the ones we were already on with. So Sam's been on with the fabrication of the screen wash and coolant expansion tanks, which I think I mentioned last week, probably showed some footage of them in the early stages last week. He's finished them this week. Um, and then Gaz has now painted those with a satin black polyurethane paint that we've used on various things on this car. Uh, in that batch, he also did a few other things. So the seat mounting um, adapters, if you like, the big mounting plates that are in the car, they've been in there for a while, just in a bare metal state from when we mocked up. But he's now painted them. Uh, also the battery tray um, that Anthony was mounting last week that's been painted black, so it looks a bit more discreet. That's now in for the final time on this. Uh, and then we were just having a look at audio system as one of the next ports of call on it. Um, so we're gonna do some speakers in the kick panels. Um, so originally there's like a, there's air ventilation through the kick panels. Um, but with the aircon system we're running in this now, I don't think there's gonna be too many problems with uh, misting up inside. So we're gonna get rid of the footwell air intakes and in their place will be mounted some speakers. We, Luke's just about to make a start on designing an, ad, an adaptation to the kick panel trim. So I think we're going to use part of the original kick panel because it has this long section that comes up the door shut and finishes it, which would be difficult to make in, in any other way, uh, or certainly not, not particularly economical to make our own. Um, but he's going to make an adapter that goes on there, which we can mount a speaker grill into that will just finish off the kick panel nicely. So. Speaker's going in there. There's also six benign's going in the back shelf, which I think Anthony's actually working on the parcel shelf right now. So we're binning the old sort of pressed fiberboard parcel shelf. 
cutting out a new one of those in 3mm uh, ABS and uh, he's just cutting the speaker holes into that now. And then one of the next things we're going to do is the amplifier mounting. So we're going to be mounting, uh, it's actually the same Audison amp I think as we've used in the Escorts. It's quite a nice setup, very compact multi-channel amplifier um, that we, we can use the Audison Bluetooth receiver with it. Uh, which plugs in via a little optical cable and then the, the controller that goes with a little ro rotary volume controller which will be run via a long cable which actually ties in slightly with the Escort so I think Adam yes yesterday or today has just run the cable down the sill on the Escort for the audio controller on that because we've, we've designed a centre console on those that integrates that little rotary volume controller and actually it's the same on this although we haven't made the final console We've carried it up and we've done a 3D printed prototype of the centre console fascia which integrates that volume control at the back. So getting that order some gear in is going to be one of the next things. Uh, and, it, and upholstery, so Dean is on right now with upholstering the Recaros for this and they're in a really nice brown leather. So I'm looking forward to seeing those and then I think the next step is going to be going through some of the interior design. If you followed us for a long while, this car was not necessarily planned exactly to be like this from the very start. The, the, the sort of project evolved a little bit as we went along. Um, and the door car design, we've never, we never went over it really. We were focusing on the metalwork. We've been focusing on small chunks because it's been a little bit of an on and off project. Um, and we've kind of got our head around how we're doing, what we're doing with the seats. But the door cards, which are just black vinyl, and I think they're new reproduction ones that were in it when we got it do look fairly respectable um, but I had a quick chat with the owner yesterday and I think he's in the in the mood for finishing them off to the same standard as everything else so I think we're going to move on to a little bit of interior design work on the door cards on this next um, but in general it is getting there um, I think really once Dean's progressed with the seats we can get all those in carpets actually I should have mentioned um, Anthony was offering up the carpets this week they're the ones that came in it and they are Again, they're new reproduction ones. They are in very good condition. We were wondering whether they would fit or not um, because we've got a larger transmission tunnel for the Tremec manual box that's in it. Uh, but actually, because we're running the centre console at the front, um, we can split the front carpet. And although the tunnel is a bit bigger, we can split it down the middle and, and it just leaves a small gap in the middle, which will be covered by the console anyway. So that's worked out quite nicely. And other than that, it all fits in there and all looks nice and clean and undamaged so we're just going to go with the carpets that were already in it so that's where we're at with that um, i'm moving over this way there's a some sort of jag subframe bomb has gone off in this area um jim has been very busy continuing with preparing all of these components so obviously he's taken that complete rear subframe that assembly that we had on the front cross member so this is the custom front cross member we did for it this is the um, Detroit Speed steering rack that we've used. And then all of the peripheral components of that have now been disassembled all into all their individual parts. And the same with the rear end. So these are the drive shafts, for example, with the UJs disassembled. So the bearings are out of those and we're down to just the core components ready to go for blasting, zinc metal spraying and powder coating. And the same applies to everything. So everything's in individual parts, but also then masked. So for instance, if I pick out this, which is, half of one of the lower wishbone uh, arrangements so these jag lower wishbones are basically two parts bolted together with the ball joint sandwiched here and then tied together with the lower spring pan um, so as you can see the bores where the bushes fit we've just cut pieces of silicon tube which go in there same on here and the uh, any threaded holes have got sacrificial bolts wound into them because these will be the original bolts but we'll be doing new bolts for it so we'll just use these as sacrificial ones so once this is powder coated we can just wind them back out and the threads are nice and clean yeah, and that kind of extends throughout so if you look at this cross member as well same deal silicon tube inside here same here works really well for blast media blasting and powder coating because the silicon withstands the heat of the powder coat bait cycle so it doesn't just melt down to nothing but it also is soft enough that the the sand blasting that's done to it first just bounces off um so it's quite a nice way of doing it and they just pull straight out again afterwards um so yeah we're uh, looking pretty good so we've basically got a load of stuff here ready to go for blast zinc metal spray powder coat this box here uh, it's all smaller fasteners that are going to be um, bead blasted and uh, zinc nickel plated. Um, and then we're left with the differential. Now that's going to go away to Simply Performance, who are going to rebuild that. 
with all new bearings, etc. We'll have a look at the crown wheel and pinion, look at the condition of that, and decide whether to replace that with new, um, dependent on the uh, what level of wear we see in that. It's an old S-type diff, so I'm not holding out chances of it being good in terms of the uh, condition of the crown wheel and pinion, but when they've worked their magic on that, that will come back to us as a, essentially a new unit. Um, so yeah, we get all this stuff away and uh, we will have all of the ingredients to build our finished subframes when that comes back. Uh, moving on from that, I think probably what's worth mentioning next is what's going on in the cab layer upstairs. Um, which is again carrying on in the same twofold nature. I might just move over here, make Jamie trip over all those boxes. <laughs> in the same sort of twofold nature as we have done for the last few weeks. So Quattro uh, and E Type. And Luke's been pressing on with the E Type. We kind of got to the point where the main console and dash structure, which we're hoping to do as one composite molding. We've got 90% there now, to the point where I could send that model to KS Composite so they could estimate me to make the tooling and make the parts for that. Next step on that before I actually pull the trigger is I want to have some sort of real world visualization of the shape and space that that takes up. Um, so what we're doing is Luke has basically plasma cut a load of cross-sectional uh, cross sections of the console and the main dash and we're going to tack them all in situ in the car to give us the actual um, outline of the structure and then we're going to create just crudely in cardboard and paper basically all the fascia of panelling around that to give us an idea of the space it takes up and we can get the seats back in the car owner can come down, he can sit in it, and we can make sure that everything kind of falls to hand how you want it to feel, everything takes the space up that you expect, it doesn't feel too cramped, etc. So that's the next step there, before we actually bite the bullet and get the tooling made to make the main parts. And then he's moved on to door card structure. So um, we're trying to design it such that the uh, glossy dash fascia actually curves round and flows into the door card. Um, and, then, and then it's working on from there how we create the look we want on the door card. And they're tiny, that's the strange thing. I, ha I keep having to say this, not only to the guys up there, to myself and to the client, that the E-Type interior is probably half the size you envisage it is when you actually look at these CAD renders. You imagine, yeah, we'll just put that vent here, we'll put that switch there, and you sort of forget that it's, everything is literally half the size you think it is. Um, so when you kind of look at the car, it recalibrates your brain and you think, oh yeah, okay. And the, the door cards are literally only like that high and, and not particularly long either. Um, so you sort of start to gravitate towards these grand ideas of how you'd lay everything out. And then when you actually sort of lay it on the real door card in real life, you think, oh uh, yeah, okay, we'll rein those ideas in a bit. Um, but at the minute, we're, gonna, we're thinking about doing quite a long longitudinal armrest at the bottom that curves up a little at the back, um, tapering that uh, glossy fascia onto the door card, but, but sort of tapering it out quite quickly so it doesn't flow all the way to the back of the card. Um, and then we'll have some buttons probably at the front of the armrest uh, because we're going to have electric windows on this. Uh, now we could do repurposed cranks, which actually is what I'm doing on the Camaro. We're going to have the window cranks repurposed as switches for the windows, but I think on the E-Type we'll do them as actual switches. And then also a switch for the opening and closing of the door, because as it stands at the minute, our plan is to have uh, electrically opening and closing doors on it with electric soft close latches. Um, and we've also done a modification, I don't know if I showed this at the time, but we've done a modification whereby we've altered the hinge um, pin angle on a redesigned hinge we're doing. So that as the doors open, they open in the normal direction, but they actually angle up as they open. Um, so it should be quite a nice party piece that you can basically press a button, the door will open up at an angle.